Hey, everybody, welcome to the Art of Transformation podcast, tools for transformation and stories about that transformation. Or I think I think I said stories about transformation and the tools to get you there. I'm going to get that. I'm going to get that right one of these days. Um, we're here with somebody who I was introduced to by another transformation expert, and I've had the honor of being on his podcast. I know that he is uh, an excellent coach and multiple author, uh, multiple time author. He's got a new book out. Um, I'm going to let you do more of the intro for yourself here, Tony, but Tony Martinetti is here. I, I couldn't be more happy to have you, Tony. I'm thrilled to be here, Mark. It has been great to get to know you um, in this short period of time, but it's just really been amazing. And I love the podcast that you've put together because it starts with one of my favorite topics, well, two favorite topics, art and transformation. You know, I'm an artist at heart, and I think that's something that um, I, I want identity. I want to stay connected to as I continue through my journey. And I'll just do a quick introduction about myself. Yeah. Um, I'm the chief inspiration officer at Inspired Purpose Partners, and we work on helping leaders to, to connect with their journey into making an impact, but without burning themselves out in the process. We do one-on-one, -on -one, we do a lot of group and um, workshop type programs. Uh, the key thing that is important is that we, we work with people who want to make that change mm. and are willing to do the work uh, because it is a co-creating process. So, yeah, well, you said, I mean, you said all of that, the, your, your idea that this is, this is creative work. Yes. And, uh, you know, especially when people are trying to run businesses and, and really concerned about the, the machine, you know, this, but it, mm. it is a creative thing to think about how to run that machine and how to do that. Well, how to lead well, how to, you know, create your revenue well, all of these different things. So you said that we're co-creating and that is something that I see over and over again. And something else you said is, you know, people have to want to do this work. I think, you know, there's a lot of people who shy off of that first phone call, that, that chemistry call where you're just sort of feeling things out because they're like, oh, they're going to try to sell me on this stuff. You know, from what I know of you and, and certainly of me, what would the point be? Yeah. You know, you can't, you can't force somebody to do this work and yeah. you know, I'm, you're not a consultant. I'm not, I mean, well, I don't know if you would, I, I maybe part of what you do is consulting, yeah. but I don't consider myself a consultant. We are co-creating together. And when we mm -hmm. decide what the work is, you know, then I support you in doing that work. <laughs> yeah. Yeah. You know, if you think about it in the, in the terms of art, you know, like, they're the canvas and we just happen to be, um, you know, part of the, the, the tools, the, 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 the paints and maybe some of the ways that we bring that the tools to, to work is to help them. They're directing the, the way that they want to bring that painting to life, but we're just helping them by bringing the different colors, um, yeah. to the canvas. Um, but they're the ones who are the canvas and they're the ones who are telling us what to do in the process because they're the ones who are the artists of their life. Exactly. So you said that we're, we're the tools. I'm curious because, you know, uh, do you know, Donald, C Donald Miller's book, the story brand book, right? Yes. He, he talks about, and what I really, really love about his framework is that, you know, when you're talking about coaching people uh, and when you're talking about working with people in, in the modality that we do, they're the artist or they're the, they're the hero. Yeah right you're not coming in as the hero to save the day they're the hero and it's and uh and you're the you know you're the guide you're the person who can sort of pull them out of you know wherever they are and say let's look at the you know let's look at the bigger picture or have you considered looking over here or what do you even see over there mm. and 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 helping them get the the strength the tools the resilience the information whatever they need to go ahead and make those either small first steps or really big leaps and you know in some cases yeah, and you're right. And it doesn't have to be this massive leap from the get-go. You know, if you try to push people too far or you try to get people thinking that they need to move so fast, so quickly, then what happens is they end up uh, giving up because they feel yes. like this is overwhelming. It's too much. And and now I'm in this place of like, whoa, um, maybe um, it's I'm going to retreat back into safety because safety felt, felt warm like a blanket. And uh, I can do do what I was doing before, and it was okay. Um, but yeah. you want to help them to feel like, hey, it's okay to step out on that 
you know, uh, that growth edge um, to go that extra few steps up the mountain and feel okay with it because it's going to feel a little uncomfortable, but that uncomfort, that discomfort is, is part of the growth process. It's part of becoming who they want to be. Well, they, they've said they want to become, but it's going to also be a sense of, you know, feeling into that next step that is going to require them to, to also not know what's next. Yeah. So you said a few things there and and it actually transitions kind of nicely into what we were talking about on the on the call we had before when we were getting ready for this podcast. This idea that, you know, when people come into this work or whether or not they work with a coach when they're in when they're in a transition, mm-hmm. you know, we live in a society that's like, you know, go big or go home, like go, 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 you know, get it, get it done, get it done now, make a big splash. But you know. But you said on our last call, you know, transformation, this work is, you said, this is not, this is not one and done kind of work. And there's a few, th- I'd love for you to expand on that. But, but one of the things that I love about that is that it gets to this idea that, you know, it's okay to not be in a huge rush. It's okay mm-hmm. to have big ideas and say, okay, what do I need to do, you know, this year, this month, this week, what do I need to do literally today? Like, what's the one thing that maybe that's a, you know, maybe that's a phone call today. But um, this idea that transformation isn't one and done, can you can you expand a little bit on that? Yeah, absolutely. And I think it starts with um, having um, dreams, uh, having you know a thought about what's uh, what's on the horizon you'd like to aspire to or to connect to, and it has to be something that comes deep from inside and saying to yourself, like, I've always had this feeling that this is something for me, and it's not coming from the external world. Because if it does, then it's not really something that might eventually, you know, long term, it might wear down and you find yourself lost in that and say like, well, you know, it wasn't really me, it was for somebody else. But if it comes from someplace inside, you say, hey, look, I've always wanted to be, and I'm just going to use this because I happen to say this recently, I've always wanted to fly a plane. Hmm. Um, True for you. It actually, I have actually, I've flown. Oh, you have flown a plane. Okay. Yes. Um, but, um, but if you say to yourself, like, that's what I've always wanted to do is to fly a plane. And you start to kind of like put yourself in trajectory of saying like, like, how do I make that dream come alive? And the starting point starts to come to, to place of like knowing, well, who, who can I talk to? What are the people I need to um, get to know? Do I know anyone who's ever flown a plane or do I know any pilots? And what does the process look like? And how do I get the discovery underway to start to put myself in trajectory? And the energy starts to kind of build from there. But it doesn't have to be this thing like, okay, tomorrow I'm signing up for flight school and everything's happening. Um, it starts right. to, with one conversation, right? One action, one step. And you know, flying a plane doesn't have to happen, happen tomorrow. It can happen a year from now. Just like anything that you that you aspire to, maybe it's like you know I really want to be in, taking a change in my career to go in a different direction. But you plant that seed and you have to let it grow, and know that it starts from that thought. That thought becomes translated into action slowly, over time. So yes, I love that idea, and it comes up a lot. Is that I you know that idea that the first step can be as simple as just finding out more because you might look at something like, you know, I have a client right now who's looking to step away from what they're doing and start their own, you know, organization. Mm -hmm. And um, he has a lot of information, but not all of the information. And what we established was, you know, what, what was kind of, what kind of holds you back is essentially sort of a fear of the unknown. Well, I, I know that I need to do these big things, but there's these huge risks in, say, the area of, you know, finance or people management or whatever. I'm worried about that. Well, why are you worried about that? Well, I don't actually have the information on how it works. Well, okay. What if you got that information? Well, I feel a lot better. Well, that's let's let's what now let's let, let's start to fill in that gap. Yeah. It's remarkable how if we identify the fear, we can identify the action in a lot of times. Exactly. Exactly. You know, it, it's it, it's similar to uh, another thing that comes to mind a lot for people is like, gosh, like there's no way I could ever speak on stage or, you know, deliver that big talk. And then all of a sudden you see them a year or two later and they're speaking with ease on on a, on a big stage. 
And I think that comes from the sense of like, well, you got to start somewhere. You got to start with like, well, what I, what would I talk about all day long if I had the opportunity? Um, what do I know? And am I passionate about talking about? Maybe that's a starting point. <laughs> yeah. Because if, yeah. if you're talking about numbers and numbers are not your gig, guess what? <laughs> You'll have a hard time talking about numbers on a big stage because you might find yourself feeling like, you know, checked out when the time comes that you're really, um, you know, put on the spot. Yeah. yeah. This reminds me of a question. I mean, it's one of those sort of, um, you know, growth questions or conversation starters. It's like, what could you talk about right now for 30 minutes without, you know, without any notes? Yeah. You know, maybe that's where you start. Yeah, exactly. And maybe that's not the talk for the big stage, but as you, maybe you practice that just on your, I, I do this all the time where I'm in my car and I'll, and I'll practice a, a toast or a speech or, you know, whatever. I'll just, I'll just sort of talk it through, not taking any notes, not recording. And I'll discover, oh, the reason that I'm worried about this is because I, I don't know how I get from this part to this part. Okay. Now I know what I need to think about. Now I know what I need to solve, but you solve, mm -hmm. you don't, you don't solve by sitting and wondering how to do it. You you take these small actions like talking to yourself in your car. <laughs> yes. Luckily, everyone's doing it. So it doesn't look as <laughs> odd as it used to in the past. But um... I just leave my headset in so no one's <laughs> like, what's happening? <laughs> yes, I love that. I mean, it's such a great way to think about it because, you know, for me, when I think about how I practice for a talk, I, I often record myself doing the talk. And that way I'm listening, getting all that, that memory in place. And it allows me to really start to think of it as just natural. It's me, you know? So I'm not listening to someone else do my talk. I'm doing, it's me doing the talk. So, well, in line with the idea that transformation is not one and done, it's a, yeah. it can be a long process. And, it, you know, the idea is, you know, you'll, you're, you're actually, you're actually transform, you're actually changing all along the way. You take yeah. those initial first steps. Now you went from someone who didn't have some information to someone who does have some information. And sometimes the information you get says, okay, that's the wrong direction. So you go back mm -hmm. and you get some different information. And it's, you know, there's a many, many different paths you can take. But something else that we talked about was this idea, and you've mentioned a few times today, this mm -hmm. idea that people get sort of burned out, burned out or, or frustrated, or they hit a plateau. And mm -hmm. maybe that's a signal for some new work to be done in this area to discover what it is that they really want to do. But we talked about the idea of the importance of I don't know exactly what word to use, but rest, the idea that you need to, you know, you need to, you need to have some movement, there needs to be kind of a sine wave, there needs to be an ebb and flow to the work you're doing, because you can't, just like anything, this is work, and you can't just go, 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 and, and never take a minute down, you have taken some pretty exceptional minutes down. I think the one that really stands out to me is that, well, I mean, you spent a month in India and you and you climbed Kilimanjaro. Wow. Yes. Forget transformation for a second. What was that like? Uh, it was definitely challenging. Um, <laughs> uh, it was something where, you know, I made the commitment to do it just after I wrote my first book called Climbing the Right Mountain. And someone asked <laughs> me, like, what's the next mountain you're going to climb? So you actually hadn't climbed a mountain when you wrote that book? Oh, yeah, I, yeah I'd, I'd, I'd climb mountains, okay. but nothing, nothing of that magnitude. That's 19,000 feet. That was probably almost double the, uh, the height that I'd been to at that point. I mean, the highest I'd been to was probably, yeah, about 11,000 feet. So anyways, long story short, making that commitment was big because, I mean, it makes a big difference, uh, especially a mountain like Kili, because you're going through a lot of different climate zones and the oxygen at the top, or, you know, even getting closer to the top, there's not a lot of oxygen to breathe. So you are really belabored um, on that journey. And uh, yeah, I mean, I suffer from headaches in general. So like having that to add on to the mix was not easy, but it was also um, a good place to be where I could stretch my own boundaries and see what's possible. So as I started to prepare, it was really about like going into climbs, you know, doing a bunch of climbs locally, but also just mentally preparing, right? Saying, hey, I can do this. I can do hard things. I'm preparing myself like to think, well, you know, what is it going to take for me to get up to the top of that mountain? Um, and what do I need to make sure I bring along with me um, in terms of um, having all the right tools and having the right gear? Um, so I had a lot of time to prepare for it, which is great. Now that you're telling me, I know you had experience climbing other mountains, but was there, were there gaps in information that you had to fill by, you know, by getting support from other people? 
Oh, absolutely. I mean, I ask, um, I, I always say that it's important. Any climb, you, you can't go it alone. And I mean that both as a physical climb, but also the climbs that we take in our lives is that we don't do it alone. We need mm-hmm. support from other people to make sure that, you know, they a give us the emotional support we need to champion us, uh, tell us like, Hey, you can do this, but also um, to give us that um, the tips and, and um, the thoughts about, Hey, when you're doing this, do this. And like, you know, make sure you put your boots in your, uh, your sleeping bag because right. that'll the keep you warm you, at night. <laughs> the stuff you don't know that you don't know. Yes, exactly. Yeah. But it's I saw... interesting you bring that up because um, when I, in my first book, I talk about um, the first climb that I had was when I was a teenager um, on Mount Washington in, in um, New Hampshire. And um, we were ill-prepared. We had a bunch of us, you know, teenagers just kind of like, hey, let's go climb the mountain. And middle of August, it's snowing at the top and we had a failed attempt. We didn't make it because we didn't, we, we were full of all of that, like hubris, hubris, we're going to call it, Yeah. but we didn't have any preparation and we didn't know what we we're doing. And that's what happens when you start to get more experience. You start to realize, yeah, you know, you have to be a little more um, prepared for the climb, prepared for where you're headed um, to make it more powerful. Yeah. And I imagine in that failed attempt, you learned about what information you might, you might need to ask for, or just that you might need to ask for information at all. Yeah, exactly. Yeah. Like have a map and maybe, you know, take the right trail because we were on the wrong trail. Or a guide. <laughs> As yeah. Yes, there we go. Back to Donald Miller. Well, there's so much that I want to ask you about that because I'm just, I'm, you know, I'm an athlete and I'm fascinated by that stuff. Um, mm-hmm. You know, some, something, something that you said earlier really resonated with me. Yeah. I think you said it simply as you have to start somewhere. And yeah. um, my, my passion in the athletic world right now is jujitsu. I used to do obstacle course races, which was running up and down mountains, but I don't think that they were quite that high. Um, <laughs> and they were ski hills. They were not <laughs> Kilimanjaro. Mm-hmm. But jujitsu is a great metaphor for me for so much of everything, but including this because you do have to start somewhere. Like nobody, there's a guy in my gym who is Aikido master. He runs mm-hmm. a dojo. He lives in the dojo. He's got a school and students. He travels the world. He is an absolute master. And he's on the mat with me at the jujitsu gym, you know, with his beginner's mind you know, on, and he started at a white belt. They didn't bring him in and say, oh, you, you know, we'll, we'll sort of speed you up. You know, he started with everybody else. And, you know, when you're, when you're going into new territory in your lives or even adding a new skill or creating a new product or a new business, that beginner's mind, I think is so important and it will save, I mean, we're, we're going to, we're going to fail sometimes. And there's so many analogies for that, but you know, it's going to save you some time just no, going in and going, there's a teacher here for me somewhere. Absolutely. Yeah. And you said the, the thing that I want to ask you about is this idea of, of, of rest. And I know yes, that this yes. was a very arduous and, you know, physically arduous and, you know, mentally and probably emotionally and kind of spiritually arduous task that you did. How was that rest? Yes. I love that you bring this back because I was thinking we didn't really quite get to the answer we were looking for earlier. And I think there's a lot to it that we need to unwind. It's when we when we step away from the doing of our work. Um, and even when I think about the, you know, people think, well, you're a coach and, you know, you do this stuff that, you know, is passionate, your passion job. Um, and it must be something you just love doing every day. And I'm like, sure, but it's still work. And it, if you start to do it repetitively over and over time, it starts to become, you know, a pattern that needs to be interrupted. And when you mm-hmm. interrupt the pattern, mm-hmm. you start to realize that it's, you know, through the rest, doing something different. And when I say rest, sometimes that's exactly what we're looking for. Not just sitting on the couch and relaxing um, or sitting on a beach and relaxing, which, you know, short versus a long um, break. It's sometimes about doing something different, mm-hmm. you know, getting into an activity and doing it for a while gets your brain programming in a different way. And so what happens is that's where the most restful rest comes from is because you're getting out of the work and you're thinking about like a making different neural connections to your life and saying, gosh, you know, I'm here on this mountain and I'm starting to put things in perspective and I'm starting to think, what do I want to return to? Who do I want to be when I return? Mm. And 
how do I want to change things that I was doing before to do them differently now? If you think about it, it's like probably shouldn't compare this to a pandemic because it's not really a good good thing. Soon, but like this soon. pandemic, <laughs> yeah, the pandemic was like a very long process of us starting to reflect and think differently about our lives. Well, you know, taking a you know three to four week break from your life and doing things differently um, has you really putting things in perspective and saying, yeah. well, maybe I don't want to return to the normal that I had before. And maybe that normal is not even possible any longer because I've got, I'm a new me now. Yes. The pandemic, un unfortunately, is a great example. It was an imposed break for a lot of people. And, you know, to be fair, it was not great for many, 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 many people. That said, this idea that I love the idea that it's not about necessarily just like going and watching Netflix, but it's about actually putting your brain on. It's one of the reasons why I love jujitsu, because my brain, I mean, you really have to be present on the mat. Otherwise, you know, otherwise you get choked out, um, so, which, which you don't ideally, you know, want to have happen. But this idea that you're doing something else, it ties into something that um, I think I did sort of a brief podcast on uh, previously, this idea of productive procrastination. This idea that, you know, you're working in your business or you're working on your art, you're working on, you know, whatever it is you're working on, you know, you hit a whatever kind of plateau, right? You hit something where you're like, okay, I've got this, maybe, maybe I'm really good at it, or maybe I'm frustrated with it, whatever that plateau is, to go and put your brain on something else in the back of your mind, in your right brain, uh, when you're, when you're on that kind of downtime doing something else that you're not necessarily you know, that isn't necessarily designed to be productive or, you know, or maybe it is, but it's just for something else. The back of your mind, the right brain part of your mind starts to make connections that it can't make if you're just, you know, on the ground every day, sort of beating the pavement, doing your thing, doing your thing. And um, the idea is that this is, you know, this is procrastinate. It feels like procrastination. I'm putting off the work that I need to do, but mm. it's really actually quite productive in terms of, like you said, at the very beginning, this is creative work. Yeah. You know, when I was teaching art, this is really, it's, it, there's such a direct analogy. When I was teaching art, you know, I'd, I'd have students and I taught figure drawing and I taught beginning illustration and, you know, students are working, you know, participants working on a painting and they get to whatever point in the painting and they're just, you know, they're starting to make really kind of lateral moves. And it's clear, like, I'm not really sure where to go from here. I would often tell them, stop, wor stop working on that for two weeks. Yeah. I'm going to give you some exactly. other assignments. You're still going to make art but I'm going to have you use materials that you didn't use. I'm going to have you make sketches that are intentionally, you know, not good. I'm going to have you just like do something that's completely different, you know, out of that, like, got, you know, go big or go home kind of mindset. And, you know, I, I cannot think of an exception to someone who came back from that and said, that's really weird. Like I was doing this totally different thing. And I, and I had an idea about what I want to do on this painting that I wasn't having before when I was sitting and staring at it every, you know, every day or your business or your, whatever it is that you're working. Mm. It's brilliant. And it has me thinking about this visual. Like, I don't know, this is going to be so weird, but I, I think you'll get it. You remember those, uh, this is your brain on, on, uh, on drugs oh, with the egg. With yeah. The, yeah. The yeah. Egg. Of course I do. You know, yeah. I see a frying pan with a, with an egg in it. And then all of a sudden you say, this is my, this is your brain after, you know, productive procrastination. And it's like full of like color and vibrancy and just like, <laughs> it's just, you know, sparkling with like all this amazingness. Like, you know, that's what we're after here is we, you know, before an interruption, it's just, you know, sizzling away or maybe not even cooking at all because <laughs> yeah. it's just doing its thing and it's not really productive or maybe it's just feeling fried. Um, and then all of a sudden you, you know, you do a, a some per procrastination on purpose or whatever you want to call it. And then you step away and you find yourself coming back to it. And it's like, whoa, all the things are starting to kind of fire up again. I can feel the, the, the color coming back. Yeah. You said that the, the Kilimanjaro break was yeah. af after your first book. Was that right? Uh, yeah. It was a year after my first book. Yeah. Yeah. So. And so I'm just curious fr from your own path, like where, where did you go after, you know, where did, where did your life, you know, where did your life lead you after that climb? Well, let me share two things real quick about the, um, the experience. Well, one thing, and then I'll share that answer to this. First of all, <laughs> What I realized is as I prepared for that that uh, climb, I also realized, wow, I'm going to be away from my business for about a month. 
because I took the climb and then I did a, a safari. And so there was a lot of this anxiety of like, well, I'm going to interrupt my business for a period of time. What am I going to do? I'm going to lose clients and such and such and such. But everyone was cool about it. And I'm on the way to the airport and I'm getting a call from somebody out of the blue about coaching. And I'm like, it's funny, I'm stepping away from my business and I got a client on the way to the airport and on the way back from the airport. You know, the less I stay so stuck in my business, the more I create business. Mm. Very weird how that is. And I yeah. think it's because there's an energetic thing we put into ourselves that we are like, we stay tight and stuck in our place and we yeah. are not putting the energy into the people who we're connecting with to tell them we're open, that we're open to connect. Yeah. Okay. And I don't know what it, that is, but it's just, that's, that's how I looked at it. But when I did come back, what I realized is that I wanted to do less with more. I wanted to find leverage and I wanted to find ways to, to find more group type of activities. Uh -huh. And so creating more programs that were connected with groups and that's what I've leaned into since I returned. Um, so I'm still doing one-on-one, -on -one, but I found myself changing the mix and doing a lot more where I could get people together. And I also realized that that's a lot about what my work is about is creating deeper connections with people. Mm. And so I've leaned heavily into the, those types of programs where I'm allowing people to have a connection. That's not just about me saying, okay, let's connect you and I one-on-one, -on -one, but it's about mm -hmm. how can I connect other people to have a more deeper experience. And that is only getting bigger in terms of the impact that I'm having um, as we go into 2024. Yeah, this is a question and we're sort of nearing the end here, but this is a question that I've been asking a lot being, you know, we're in the end of January now. So it's, you know, this is just past New Year's. And I can't say I've never been a fan of resolutions, but I'm real clear that I don't do them anymore because they're BS, I think. But, I, you know, it's good. It's good to have goals. It's great. Um, yeah. But, you know, I'm not going to sit here and say I'm going to make just like you said, like I'm not going to make some giant change in my life. You know, the you know gym memberships go way up in January and then no one shows up. That kind of yeah. thing. I'd rather think about the small, subtle shifts that I'm going to make that are going to over time get me where I want to go. So I'm not going to go to the gym for five hours a day or go to jujitsu five days a week. You know, if I'm, if I'm, if I've not done it before, if I'm not doing it very much, I'll, I'll add one day or, you know, I'll, I'll exercise at home for, I used to, I used to just exercise at home for 25 minutes a day. And I could, I could maintain that. And it got me to the place where I wanted to be physically. Um, and I mm -hmm. found out I actually, I actually didn't have to do all the stuff that, that everyone else was saying, because I was in action and discovering my authentic truth, my path, along the way. So the question that I've been dancing around here is um, <laughs> what is a challenge that you're excited about in the coming year? Ooh, I love that. And, and yeah, I'm kind of like, um, I'm done with resolutions. I just have, and, but I do have some words that I'm working with and there are ones I've mentioned leverage and connection are the two big macro words that I've already mm -hmm. mentioned, but they're all um, very important to me. So the challenge that I'm uh, embracing is um, is to have more meaningful conversations with people who I wouldn't normally connect with. So I'm mm. I'm kind of like reaching out to folks who I've kind of like not necessarily like cast off, but I just haven't you know had conversations with, and I'm just exploring the edges of my um, my network of my of the world that I've that I live in, and trying to find out what I where I could. Um, learn more from other people. Mm. And so it's a, it sounds like a weird challenge because it's like, yeah, sure. That sounds like it's natural for you, but it's also something that it's about really seeing where I may be wrong about my assumptions and I want to be so that I can learn even more. Um, so that means getting into communities that I haven't been part of, um, going to places that I haven't been to, not just like physically, but, you know, maybe a conference or things like that, that I haven't really embraced. Um, so that's where I'm at. That sounds like a great challenge. And it is, I can agree with you and tell you, you know, yeah, oh, just have conversations with people. Um, like you said before, yes, I love it. And it's energy. It's, I, you know, I, I would, I would use the word energy over work just to, you know, just to say like, it's, it's not bad. 
but it is energy, you know, like I, yeah. I love, I love cooking. I love cooking and I, and I cook every day if I can. And I cook for my family a lot and it is energy. Like at the end, you know, I have, I have spent some energy and just thinking about the, you know, the exchange of energy I get with my family. I have a teenager, so the exchange is pretty one-sided right now, but you know, there is, there is energy put in and, and, and sometimes that energy, you know, comes back in really positive ways and you learn, you know, new things and you learn things that you don't want to do. But that's how, I mean, this is, this is the not one and done. This is the ongoing life of, of transformation. Yes. yes. I, you know, as, as I said, when I just published my latest book, I was like, look, uh, this book, my book is not done yet. It's close. You know, I just continue to write more chapters and I think that's <laughs> the best way to look at it. And uh, transformation for me is, is never complete. Um, mm -hmm. So. Yeah, I think in, in my group program right now, somebody uh, shared a really, I, I think, thoughtful uh, analogy or way of thinking about this, you know, and it was it was related to art, but it was, you know, the, you know, getting to whatever it was, getting to 80% done or, or, or complete takes X amount of time. Mm -hmm. The 80 to 90% takes the same amount of time as the first 80. And then the last 10% takes as much time or more as all of that put together, you know? So, <laughs> so the question, you know, so, so one, you know, one thing is just, you know, being in the mindset of like, okay, this last 10% is going to go slow or to say, you know what? 90% is, is good. I'm going to launch or go at 90% and figure other things out, you know, as we go, you can kind of approach yeah. it different ways, right? That's brilliant. I really like that because there's something about that, which is to say, people might be scared about that taking so, so much time or so much effort. But it's also a really great reframe about that, which is to say, it's amazing that that's going to take a long time because what else would you live for? <laughs> right. Um, it's, a, it's great to be able to have, you know, your, if you think about it as an iceberg that, you know, the, the known part is the part that we already know the 80% technically, but in reality, that 10%, which we think is uh, a small portion, but it's the, it's the unknown part of us. Mm. that we we had to continue to lean into and that is unknown to us unknown to everyone else and that's what's so cool yeah we're coming towards the end here i wanted to make sure to ask you uh, about your book so if you can tell oh, us sure. just a little bit about that and maybe where people can find it and then you know i know you're looking to have conversations with people so if people are listening to this and they're like this is i'd love to have a conversation with tony and find out what he's about let us know how to how to find you there. So let's start with the book and then you can tell us how to find you. Sure. Sounds great. First of all, the book's called Campfire Lessons for Leaders, How Uncovering Your Past Can Propel You Forward. Mm. And the book is really about, you can, um, it's about the journey that people have gone gone on to to find themselves and um and how you when you look back and understand your past, it can be a powerful tool. And uh, what I've done is I've compiled 10, 10 lessons that will help you to think differently. And there's some, some good questions and prompts along the way to help you on your journey. But I've also backed it up with some amazing stories from people who have been on my podcast that um, have been on transformational journeys. Some of them really sudden and, and uh, dramatic um, and some just gradual and coming from these moments that have said like, you know, I'm not living life I want to, and I know I'm ready for something different. So I think you'll find that at the core of this all, it's about connection, connection with your story, connecting with yourself, and ultimately connecting with others um, mm. on your journey of life. And you can find that on Amazon or anywhere else, uh, wherever books are sold. I say that with a caveat because you never know about small bookstores these days. Mm -hmm. They're hard to uh, to know what they'll carry. Although I, uh, I found but, that uh, Bookshop is a great, bookshop.org, or I think it's yeah. .org, maybe. You can search for books and then... And then find whatever local bookshop has it. Uh, so it's idea. it's like a it's like a book it's like a local bookstore aggregator. So maybe your local awesome. bookshop doesn't have it, but maybe one five miles away does. And bookshop will will help you find it, you know, close to you, so you can support a local bookstore that way. I love it. That's fantastic. Yeah. So uh, and beyond the book, another great place to find me is on my website. Um, it's ipurposepartners.com. And if you go there, you can reach out and find, connect with me. You know, we can have a conversation and see where we want to go from there. I'm also available and very active on LinkedIn. <laughs> I know. I feel like I, I just turned 47 last year and I feel like 
uh, somewhere in my mid forties, I I turned the LinkedIn is cool years old. Uh, <laughs> I know. I still like Instagram, but you know, it's a uh, LinkedIn is, is still. Yeah. Uh, yeah. And uh, lest I forget, uh, and I'll link to this, I'll link to our podcast, our previous podcast yes. episode on your podcast and tell, and just briefly tell us about your podcast. Yes. Uh, the virtual campfire. Um, I've on included, brand. <laughs> yes, very much so. Right. And uh, you can find um, that show anywhere you listen to podcasts, but also you can find a link to it on my pot on my website. And um, I've recorded now north of 200 episodes, which has been a great journey. And it's um, really covering stories of people who have been through a transformational moment through what I call flashpoints, these points in our journey. They've ignited our gifts into the world. And yes, definitely go check out Mark's episode. It is fantastic. <laughs> Thank you for the plug. We'll be sure to link for uh, link all of these things in the show notes. Um, Tony, I feel like I feel like we've got 10 more podcasts in us at least just from this conversation, but we have to say goodbye now. I want to thank you so much for taking the time with me before the show, during the show, and I really look forward to continuing our conversations in the future. Same here. Thank you so much. Mm -hmm.